Hackathon Techies Podcast. I'm your host, tech entrepreneur, executive coach, and Chicago Booth MBA, Sophia Matilda. My aim here is to help you have a great career in the digital age. In a time when even your coffee shop has an app, you simply have to speak tech. On this podcast, I share core technology concepts, help you relate them to business outcomes, and most importantly, share practical advice on what you can do to become a digital leader today. If you want to have a great career in the digital age, this podcast is for you. Hello, smart people. How are you today? I am currently on the 38th floor of a gorgeous building in Tribeca. It's literally opposite the New York Stock Exchange. And I moved here from the Upper East Side last week and I wanted to try out a new neighborhood. And you know what? I am loving it. I feel like I'm literally in the heart of capitalism and that's my thing. If you're a New Yorker, let me know what your favorite neighborhood is to live in. I know this is quite a controversial topic, but I am genuinely curious. I am exploring. I'm open to suggestions, so just DM me on LinkedIn or on Instagram and tell me what you think. Speaking of New York City, I am going to teach several classes in person in Manhattan this April. So if you want to meet in real life and if you want to learn and ask your questions, then you've got to come to these classes. The way to find out about what's going on is to sign up to my emails or just go to techfonontechies.co forward slash events. But signing up to emails is much better because that way you won't miss a thing. Today, my dear smart listeners, we are going to hear from Dr. Thomas Chamorro Primuzic. He's a psychologist who has studied how artificial intelligence is changing how we behave. He came to speak to our members recently, and you'll hear excerpts from our conversations and a member question. The thing is, humans create technology, but then that technology changes us. And you can actually see that with the printed press. So that technological invention led to Lutheranism spreading, and then that was the cause of the religious wars in Europe, Protestantism in England, and then the Puritans coming to the US. Okay, so I have literally just summed up centuries of history in one sentence, and of course it was more complicated than that for the history nerds here. But what I want you to see here is that technological change influences history on a massive scale. And the biggest technological trend right now is the rise of AI. So if you want to be a thoughtful leader in the digital age, you need to understand what AI is doing to us so you can reap the benefits of this technology and minimize the costs. Dr. Chamara Primuzic writes about this in his book, and it's called iHuman, AI Automation and the Quest to Reclaim What Makes Us Unique. And the link to that is in the show notes. And now let's learn. Welcome, Dr. Thomas Chamorro from Music to Tech Funnel Techies. I'm so excited to talk to you about your book because it's got some really funny and insightful stuff in it. Thank you. So I wanted to start with this sentence, which really amused me. So you said, we may have wanted artificial intelligence, but have encountered human stupidity instead. So, can you talk us through this interesting statement? AI keeps getting more human-like in terms of its intellect, and humans are becoming more like robots or machines and diluting their own intellectual capacity. And um, I know you talk about this in the book, but could you share some examples with us? Sure. Yeah. So, I guess the best way to structure this is along the lines of the main sort of dark side attributes or flaws and desirable behaviors that the AI age has amplified. Uh, it has made us more distracted. It, you know, I don't know how long we'll speak for here, but it will be a miracle if we don't multitask in the next half an hour. Let's see if we can manage. It has also made us more <laughs> impatient uh you know in in the beginning of the digital age we would get extremely excited listening to that 
noise for 30 seconds that would get us online. You know, it was exciting, a window into the digital universe. And now if you have your browser crashing or, you know, slowing down or buffering for three seconds, you want to break or smash your computer. It has also, and is making us more biased. This one is a really interesting one because humans are biased by design, but we have the ability to create technology such as AI that could de-bias the work and various aspects of life by making it more data-driven. But actually the main users of AI have co-opted our biases and amplified them. So we're all turning into a more exaggerated version of ourselves. We're all becoming more and more isolated from people who think differently from us. And in the meantime, we all see ourselves as open-minded because we hang out with people who think exactly like us, who we call open-minded in turn. We are also becoming, and because of AI, are becoming more narcissistic. AI has normalized displays of self-promotion and egotistical tendencies. You know, our egos have been inflating over time, but in the AI age, everything that would make you obnoxious in the analog world makes you an influencer or popular on social media. You know, if you go around an office or any social setting, just talking about yourself, ignoring what everybody says and desperately seeking for approval, you'll be labeled a pathetic, insecure narcissist. But in the AI age, you get lots of followers in social media. And it is also making us more predictable. So that's another kind of uh, vice or flaw that it's amplifying. You know, our, our, I think, behaviors have been made more predictable by the algorithms that make money out of predicting our behaviors. So, you know, it's just like some people are more boring and repetitive than others. Those who are less boring and repetitive are more unpredictable and therefore they are tricky objects for AI and algorithms. So most of the platforms where AI sits and lives uh, aim to standardize human behavior and extract any richness and any creativity from us, our souls and our behavior. So that's kind of the bleak, the bleak, bleak kind of a, a overview of things. I think it is important to be realistic because if we don't like what we see, we have an opportunity to change it, right? And that's very much the intent of this book. You know, also I wondered, doesn't technology just make us more impatient in general? Because, you know, first we had the horse. So the horse only gave us a certain amount of speed. And then we upgraded to cars and trains. And then essentially our capacity for speed improved. And so then we started becoming more impatient. And, you know, and so on and so forth. So while, yes, we are becoming more impatient and, you know, there's this whole kind of, um, if you order it now, you expect it in a big city to deliver it in, in an hour, which basically means only Amazon can really compete. But then on the other side, well, technological progress does speed things up. And so we have been becoming more and more impatient for years. So how do you balance that argument of, yes, we want to remain human, but also you don't want to be a Luddite? Yeah. Yeah, of course. And uh, so absolutely, in full agreement, and but I think it's important to realize that we also have the capacity to resist um, these big waves of technological uh, optimization, right? So you're right. Most technologies optimize uh, or are optimized for speed, efficiency, productivity, for doing things faster. But if you're running faster in the wrong direction, you're going to get lost sooner, not later. And just like you know, the fast food industry has enabled us to, you know, be incompetent cooks and lazy kind of uh, visitors of restaurants and antisocial in the sense that we can order in and have lunch or dinner in front of our computers while watching our favorite, binge watching our favorite Netflix series. Uh, it has also revived or ignited the slow food movement and more appreciation for farm-to-table farm kind of restaurants and 
you know in the same way in an age where we are bombarded by ubiquitous distractions that has ignited the mindfulness movement even if it is also partly reliant on technology and ai because you have headspace etc and uh, so i think yes the important thing is that we don't optimize our existence for fast and furious when in fact that has never been the recipe for happiness or success in a way so i think what we have to do is keep using and leveraging these technologies to improve efficiencies and productivities but then reinvest the time we save in more meaningful and fulfilling activities and again chat gpt could be an example you know it's absolutely no question that a lot of people are writing essays, proposals, emails, and even books and novels or journalism articles using it. But there's a difference between just copying and pasting, which would actually make you irrelevant or uninteresting, or producing a first draft to add on to it and save you know 20 or 30% of the time. So you have to find ways to become augmented by the technology as opposed to diminished by it. In your book, when you say that AI is making our behavior more predictable, could you just talk us through that example? Because I thought it was fascinating. Some people have defined AI as a prediction machine, a definition which I very much like because fundamentally, you know, AI is a pattern identification tool which with very little supervision is able of identifying millions of patterns in very large databases or data sets and get better at it and more and more accurate right so but despite the fact that we've had we've been living in an age of big data now for 10 or 20 years where lots of organizations companies institutions and governments have huge and vast data sets on people, it doesn't seem like AI's ability to predict ourselves has improved a lot or keeps improving, right? Most of us are exposed to AI in the form of recommendation engines or algorithms that would show us, you know, a pair of trainers or sneakers that we just bought or uh, the same hotel we decided not to book on Expedia and so on. So I think the very, very limited by our past behaviors. And, you know, there's no sense that they have really revealed something about ourselves that we didn't know or that our friends don't know as well. But in the process, the value of all these companies that have these algorithms and have created or deployed these artificial intelligence engines and have harnessed these vast data sets have increased exponentially and continue to increase, right? So recently when Google failed to launch a rival product to ChatGPT because it bombed in the launch, I mean, it dropped or lost 100 billion in market cap from its valuation. That's simply for giving the impression that its AI wasn't as good as a new competitor, a relatively small firm that arrived, um, which probably made Microsoft very happy. But so AI is still selling predictions or predictive models of our behavior and is doing, doing so successfully because it's, it's um, the um, area or realm of behaviors or behavioral repertoire that it aims to predict is very, very, very constrained. And it's constraining it at the same time, right? So Netflix may only show you five or six movies that apparently match your preferences. And even if they don't, you know, there's a certain laziness that stops you from scrolling and finding and actually telling Netflix that, you didn't want to see these movies, especially because if you did that, there's so much to choose that you might spend more time trying to find something than actually watching that movie. And of course, this can lead to marital disputes or disputes with your partner and so on. Same for when Twitter or you know LinkedIn or any kind of media outlet shows us news. Instead of kind of giving us the full range of of alternative, it constrains it to a very narrow range that is 
broadly in sync with our filter bubble and echo chamber, but also it relies on our laziness to click on all these things to sell the illusion of predictability, where in fact it's dealing with a very, very narrow range of predictions and in the process has made us more predictable, right? It's almost like a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. I think Henry Ford famously said, my customers can have their car in any color so long as it's black. And here we are in an age where we have tons and tons of choice in any area of products and services. But in order to predict those cho choices, AI is only showing us some of them. And uh, you mentioned Amazon delivery, and that's a good one, right? Because the Amazon algorithm is only has 5% of accuracy, which might sound like very little, actually, but it means that for every 100 products it shows you, you'll buy five, which is quite impressive, right? If it could increase that to 6%, it would, all, it would already make sense for them, financial sense or economic sense, to post you things directly and not wait for you to buy them. But it cannot increase 6%. What it can do is just show you the same range of narrow products to you know, increase artificially the accuracy of its prediction. Because if I'm only showing you, you know, the 20 things that for sure you have bought in the past, et cetera, you'll be a recurrent buyer. But then here we are ordering the same things over and over again, consuming the same news um, articles and watching the same movies or consuming or listening to the same songs, as opposed to thinking, hey, hey, uh, show me something that I haven't heard before or try to make me an open-minded person or turn me into a more open-minded or open version of us, which I think if we tried to do this, we would all leave and shut down, you know, our membership to these services and try to go somewhere else. So I can see we've got some very smart uh, Tech for Non-Techies members here, and I know that you have questions. So if you have a question, just put up your hand and then I will unmute you and then Please introduce yourself and ask your question. In the meantime, I'll keep on. I'll keep on going. But when you have your questions, just raise up your hand. In practice, if you are using, say, ChatGPT, or you are using an AI assistant, um, but your job is still an intellectual job where you, you know you have to use your creativity and empathy, what would you say to that person? How I say, do, look, how do yeah, you, yeah. First of all, I think there's a lot to leverage through teams. So I don't see this as a kind of one-on-one -on -one tutorial or coaching or manager to uh, employee diet, but let's get the team together. Let's share experiences, practices. Let's ensure that everybody in the team has the minimum level of knowledge to understand what this tool does. Let's share pros and cons. Let's give examples of how we have been using it uh, to increase our productivity. Let's hear horror stories and positive success stories. Let's also spend some time to learn and split the team into different tasks for exploration, how to use it in you know, A, B, C, D, look at what competitors are doing, read what the creators of technology themselves are doing, and you know, cultivate our hungry mind in that process. And then let's measure what works and what doesn't and try to um, scale or extrapolate from you know, the good stories. And I think no different from deciding you know, what to do with Google search or Wikipedia or the internet when it just came, there's always early adopters and there's always laggers. But at the end, technologies are here to stay and there's still a lot of room for human creativity at the individual and at the collective level and how these can be used no different by the way from you know when synthesizers or uh, digital kind of uh, technologies in other space were invented and we may have thought okay they're going to kill um you know analog musicians or classical music or how you know photography and the mass production of art didn't kill the market for painters. It gave us pop art. And then there's always a version or an iteration of contemporary art that actually advances the narrative and creates something new and new and new. It's always 
the intersection between humans and technology that is more interesting than one without the other. I can see Gladys is also inspired to ask a question. So Gladys, introduce yourself, say what you do, and then please ask your question. Hi, my name is Gladys Vogley. I am the co-founder and CEO of Mangos.ai. Uh, we are an AI mental health company that studies speech, voice, and acoustics to detect mental health symptoms. And uh, my question is, we're, we're seeing this gold rush to AI. And we we see, you know, the self-made billionaires, the Elon Musks, the Sam Outman talk about ethical and how dangerous AI will be. Uh, from a technology standpoint, we've seen the industry move at a, at a velocity rate that it's not manageable. But when it comes to law, government, and regulation, there is nothing to tackle uh, AI on any level. How do you foresee this shift uh, to address some of the concerns around AI? Great question. And look, I think regulation is definitely trying to keep up or catch up. You're right. It cannot, it's always playing catch up, right? And uh, sometimes it's very behind. Um, sometimes it's, you know, it's, fa it's fast enough. I mean, usually it happens after some bad outcomes, you know, government cannot move very fast by definition. I mean, you have the usual bureaucracy, et cetera, and they, and they operate at their pace. Um, what I find interesting, though, is that I think sometimes there is also over-regulation that can be counterproductive, especially because it tries to move too fast. And actually, you know, in the area that you're working on, if it comes to, like, not so much, you know, voice or speech recognition, but if you think about face recognition or using video images as signals for AI, that's been made or will be made virtually illegal in even a lot of states of the US because of some bad PR stories that, you know, um, past users were not properly um able to disentangle ethnicity or were conflated with ethnicity bias, which are all problems that we know and we need to address. But what if we're missing out on the opportunity to improve, let's say, medical diagnosis or well-being, et cetera, because we have something that can be a tool that improves over what people or humans can do intuitively. So I think, look, I think there is an attempt, even in the US, but especially in Europe, to regulate so that you can't get away with murder and there is always a benefit for the user and uh, it's imperfect but we need not necessarily more but better regulation so that actually we enable the right amount of innovation and we leverage the good part while actually mitigating the risks of the of the bad part so you know i think again nuance and and, and a healthy balance here is the answer yeah, com completely agree. It's just very odd because when it comes to government right now, you don't really see anyone taking the lead on AI and the technological advancements that have been made. We're still stuck on January 6th. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And again, huge variability. Obviously, in most parts of the world, still people are not even thinking about this. In some, it's quite advanced. Um I think that the advantage is that the principles are quite universal, right? So informed consent, transparency, data protection, benefit for the user, even data ownership, explainability. And I think the main one we need to understand that I very much hope regulators understand is that AI should not be perfect. It should be better than the status quo, right? Mm -hmm. The same is like if a, if a video interview is 20 or 30% better than a human interviewer, please let's not throw it away because there is one or two cases of video interviewing gone wrong. When in the meantime, millions of human interviewers get away with their worst biases and remain completely unaccountable. Yeah, but thank you so much. This is great. Thank you. Can you see the incredible members we have at Techfin on Techies and the high-level discussions happening in our membership? You've just heard excerpts from a much longer discussion, which we edited down for you. 
And you know, sometimes when I listen to the discussions between our members and our speakers, I just cannot believe what I have created. If you want to join smart people like Gladys and hear speakers like Dr. Thomas Pramuzic and ask them your questions, then the only way to do that is by joining Tech for Techies. Tech for Techies is the best investment that you can make in your career in the digital age. Our members lead digital transformation. They started tech businesses, as you heard today, and they have become smart money investors. What is not to like? So come join us. All of the links are in the show notes or just go to techfunontechies.co. And as always, remember what Benjamin Franklin told us. He said an investment in education pays the best dividend. So why not invest in yourself today? On that note, thank you very much for listening. I really do appreciate your attention and I love the time that we get to spend together. Now go have a fabulous day, go thrive and I will be back in your delightful smart ears next week. Ciao.